Hey guys, what's going on? Josh here from Polymathics, the YouTube channel that helps you become a modern day renaissance man. And today we are continuing our series in the monomyth, also known as the hero's journey. Specifically, we're going to talk about the second phase, the initiation phase, and we're going to talk about the dragon battle. Now, if you're following along with me in Joseph Campbell's book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, you may not find the dragon's battle in the book, at least not spelled out. And that's because Joseph Campbell didn't necessarily differentiate the dragon's battle with the atonement with the father and apotheosis. But the dragon's battle kind of happens right around the same point. And as I mentioned in some of my earlier videos, we're not just going off of Joseph Campbell's work, we're looking at his body of work, not just, not just the heroes with a thousand faces. Additionally, we're looking at other mythological works in order to kind of tie everything in. And what I've noticed in my own studies is that the dragon battle is a key component. Now, some people may not call it the dragon battle, and I'll get to that in a minute. Some people may call it the central ordeal or the crisis. In Christopher Vogler's book, The Writer's Journey, that's how he describes it, the crisis. And in his book, he notes that when you look at the term crisis, it comes from the same root word as critic, critical, it means to cut in half. And normally this crisis event, this dragon battle, this ordeal is going to happen somewhere in the middle to middle end of the story. And what it does is it turns, it flips the situation on its head and it puts the hero in even worse straits than he was before. And it really makes him have to dig in in order to complete his journey. And the way I like to look at it is it's almost like the, the quiz, the pop quiz that happens right before the final test. It's like, okay, next week we're gonna have the final test. This is the quiz that's here to prepare you for that test. And the reason why I'm going with the title The Dragon's Battle versus something else like Crisis or Central Ordeal is just because in my mind it's really easy to differentiate. And, I'll, and we'll dive into that as well. When we look back at Joseph Campbell's work and some of his interviews, he talks about there, were, there are several different dragons that are introduced in mythology. And there are two main kind of dragons. There's a, a malevolent, malevolent dragon and a benevolent dragon. And one, one comes from the West and one comes from the East in terms of like the, you know, not literally where they come from, but like historically, that, that's where we find those mythologies. And one dragon, which I believe is the Eastern dragon, is this dragon that's very happy-go-lucky. He is kind of good luck and, and things like that. That is not the dragon that we're talking about right now. The dragon that we're talking about is the Western culture dragon of greed, so to speak. Now, it's not always greed that the dragon represents, but in many mythological stories, that's what the dragon did represent. And the key here is that the dragon battle is going to be symbolic of... It's going to be a physical representation, that dragon, that monster, that whatever it is, that physical ordeal that they have to go through is going to be symbolic of the thing with inside themselves that they are struggling to defeat. So, for example, one of the, one of the perfect examples of this is J.R.R. Tolkien's dragon Smaug. Not only is he a literal dragon, 
but he does a perfect job of representing what King Thorin has to overcome in order to, to defeat the, the white orc at the end of the story. And basically, the dragon, so sticking with this Lord of the Rings example, the dragon represents King Thorin's greed and lust for power. And the reason why this is so important and the reason why this is also related to the, the atonement with the father is because if we look at the dragon, Smaug, it has a lust for gold. It, it, that's why it came. It has the Ark and Stone. That's why it came and took the mountain. But prior to that, before the dragon came, that was the thing that corrupted the dwarves. And the, the, the way we know this symbolically is both Thor, Thorin's father went crazy, but his grandfather went, also had this lust, this very similar lust. I think they call it like dragon's disease or something in the book, but essentially Thorin has to overcome that. And we see that, excuse me, in the, at the end and especially at the, the beginning of the third movie that, <clears throat> that was made is that Thorin becomes like consumed by this lust for all of the treasure that he has in the mountain. And he also is infuriated that he can't find the Arkenstone and he starts to to mistrust and distrust all of his closest friends and allies. And this is exactly what he has to overcome, not only in the dragon, but in himself. So even though, so as I said before, right, the dragon is the physical representation. They fight Smog, they defeat Smog, then Smog, like in, in vengeance, goes to the city of Dale wreaks havoc, but luckily the his name is escaping me, but the 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 fisherman ends up killing him and defeating him. With again, this is going back to Atonement of the Father, which we'll have a whole nother video on, but the way he defeats him is with his son and with the the black arrow of his father or grandfather, something like that. So again, bloodlines, everything like that. Now, why do we always go back to the father and why is this tied in with the dragon? A lot of times the dragon also represents our lineage and our father, our, not, our, not our literal fathers, but our bloodline and where we came from. And the hero's quest in a sense, Joseph Campbell would say, is to go out and find your father's mission. Sometimes you have to go out and slay your father in a sense. And sometimes you go out and you, you take on their, his mission because the father was, was lost. If we look at Raiders of the Lost Ark, Indiana Jones goes after his father in order to find him. And then they work together to, to, um, to find the, the Holy Grail. Additionally, if we look at several other stories, the, the, theme, the theme holds true. You're going, uh, Star Wars, right? Luke doesn't know, at the time, Luke doesn't know who his father is. So he joins Obi-Wan on this foolish crusade to go and help serve the, the people that his father once served, right? So, and, and later on, he ends up facing his father, who ends up being Darth Vader. And again, that's all... If we look at the psychological aspects, it's the hero or a person going on a journey to fulfill their destiny, to become an adult functioning in the real world. So the dragon, again, I say the dragon battle not only because it's a well-known term, but also because it's easy to identify with. But the ordeal doesn't, it doesn't even have to be a person. It could be an inner conflict. It could be some sort of 
construct. It doesn't have to be a person or a dragon. But this is just a very easy way to symbolize what it means. Because in the end, whatever the ordeal is, it has to symbolize that major issue that the hero has to overcome in order to fulfill his journey. And another really great example of this, one of my favorite movies of all time, is the movie Aliens with Sigourney Weaver. In roughly the middle of the movie, it's the middle end of the movie, Newt has gone missing. All of the Marines have basically been killed or injured. She, she takes Hicks, puts him on the plane with Bishop, and she tells Bishop, I'm going back for the girl. Now, this is sort of towards the end of the movie, so you might say, well, this isn't really delineating. In this part, she is going down to face the dragon, which is the queen alien. And she has to take, it's basically a pop quiz. She has to take all the lessons she's learned from the Marines and her life and about aliens and all this other stuff in order to go into the snake pit, so to speak, and save the girl. She brings her watch. She brings the flamethrower. She brings her rifle. She has everything. She goes in there. She retrieves the girl and she momentarily defeats the aliens. Not only does she take some of the, the soldiers down, she basically destroys the brood, right? All of the alien um, pots. And then also, she takes a stab at the queen, in a, in a sense. So, that in a real way, that's Ripley having to go down and face what that movie's theme is, the, the, thing that, the thing that her hero has to overcome, which is fear. And this whole time, she's been running away. She didn't want to go face the aliens. She didn't want to go back. And then finally, she's been put in this position where the one thing that she cares about, which is Newt, which is symbolic of innocence and purity and her daughter who died, she, she has to make a decision. And she decides to, to go beyond her fear and go down into that, that alien pit of death, basically, to save what she believes and sacrifice herself for what she believes is truly important. And, and then what happens is, now this is the interesting thing about the dragon battle. A lot of times the dragon will be defeated, but not necessarily destroyed and the dragon will then become the final climactic battle at the end where again the hero has to show what they've learned and this time for real and if we go back to aliens this is the final battle with Ripley where in order to protect Newt she has to face the dragon she has to face the queen alien one on one and eventually s open the airlock and basically sacrifice herself because if if it doesn't work she's dead but she'd rather go down fighting for what she cares for than to run away or to allow what she believes to be purity in a sense to be injured by this alien the same thing holds true for if we look at King Thorn and going back to the Lord of the Rings example, he defeats Smaug and then later has to fight the final battle with the White Orc. And although the White Orc is not the dragon, so to speak, the way he defeats the White Orc, at least in the movie, is he sacrifices himself. He goes beyond the greatest, the greatest greed of all which is your own self and he and he realizes the only way to defeat the orc in the end is to is he has to let the orc get so close to him by killing him that he can then take the orc out and that's sort of the theme there is to s sacrifice yourself sacrifice your own well-being not in the sense of just like committing suicide or anything like that but in the sense of for the greater good, instead of doing what's only good for you, instead of only looking out for yourself, sacrifice 
for the greater good and you can overcome those obstacles. And he does. He ends up defeating the white orc and saving his people, which in turn creates his legacy, which is why Thorne is remembered as such an epic hero. It's Yes, he had faults, but really the reason why he's so epic isn't because he defeated a dragon in a work, but because he overcame those faults, and that's what allowed him to defeat those dragons or those monsters. So, as I said before, the dragon battle, if you're researching this, isn't always differentiated or delineated in some of the writings, but it's, it's a key component, and whatever that dragon is, it, it needs to symbolically represent the struggle or the difficulty that the hero must overcome, the main flaw that the hero must overcome in order to succeed in his journey. So that's it. If you have any questions, go ahead and drop them down below. If you, uh, if you liked the video, give me a like. And if you want to hear more, feel free to subscribe, and then these videos will continue to come to you as I put them out. But until next time, take it easy.